Okay, so we're going to talk about threads. And the first question I'm going to ask you guys. Okay, so some of you don't have knowledge of threads, implementation at least. So this should be particularly useful for you guys. So we've already touched on threads in, in our first lecture. We said threads are units of concurrency within processes. Both processes and threads are units of concurrency. They have independent stack pointers, There's a stacks and independent uh, program counters. And the real difference is that uh, processes can be, uh, coupled processes can be on different computers, whereas threads within a particular process have to be in the computer on which the process executes. And, and that's because they share memory and we don't have shared memory abstractions, commonplace at least, uh, that, that span multiple computers. Okay? So we, we understand threads to at least that degree. And uh, that means that we have these three cases. We can have communicating or connect. We said that a distributed program involves coupled processes, processes that are interdependent, okay? Whose, whose actions affect other processes. So we can write a distributed program where processes talk to each other, but none of the individual processes have threads within them. We can have processes that are not, we can have a process that is not part of a distributed program that has threads in it. Or we can have processes that are connected to each other and have threads within them. Okay. And I'm going to argue that the third case is typical. That distributed coupled processes kind of implies uh, and I say kind of, because you can always write programs um, that violate this rule, uh, implies concurrency within, within, within the process. Okay? And I'm going to ask you guys why. And before I really ask you guys the question, let me go and give you a motivating example to make things more concrete. So um, before I do that, uh, let me just summarize again. The relationship between concurrency and distribution is that you can abstract them both to a common uh, common abstraction, which is really two pieces of code running concurrently. That's, that, that's a property that both threads and processes have. Okay, so even if, we, if this, this, this uh, course is all about processes and how they talk to other processes, by understanding threads, you'll understand, and, and coordinating threads, you'll understand coordinating processes also. Okay, and more important, Process coupling often requires the creation of threads in the coupled processes. And here's the example to try to justify that statement. So this is the example we've seen many times. You have three processes that replicate some state. And the state happens to be a simulation. And each process is interactive. So in the process, I can say move 100 minus 100, and we see that all of the processes get affected. Okay, so the change made by one process is broadcast to all of the processes. And there's not just one inputting process. Another process can then undo that change and the state, uh, the undo part also gets broadcast to everybody else. Okay. So we have this concrete example. We have this statement that processes often require the creation of threads in the communicating processes. So my question to you. So as you guys said, um, the network may be slow. Um, and you want to do other work while waiting for messages from the network and that other work could involve uh, doing the main work of the process, which could be, in our example, just handling the local user. There's a local user active there. So let's get more specific here. Um, in general, when you have a bunch of communicating processes, you, you typically add an intermediary process that helps with the communication. And that process acts like a server. And then you have these clients doing the real work. Okay, so in that particular Halloween simulation, when you guys implement it, there will be a bunch of clients. Each client will be interacting with its own user. And you'll have a server behind the scenes. Also. Okay, and the clients will not talk directly to each other, uh, but through the server. Okay, there's many reasons to do that, having to do with consistency, um, having to do with programmability, uh, but that's the case. Okay. So I could write my client as follows, and this is where the answers you guys gave make sense now. 
I could say wait for local user input. This is the main work that you guys are talking about. Process the user input. Now I've got to go in to the next step. When, when I was not distributed, I would just go and wait for user input again. But I have to also wait for remote user input, either directly from the remote process or through from the server, and then reprocess that. Okay, so this is what I have to write if I have a single thread. Okay, and the server has to also wait. It has to wait for client one's message. Maybe the client one will send a message. In case it processes that client's message, or maybe another client will send a message, uh, and and these these clients have different separate streams of uh, messages. Okay, so you, so they're not intermixed together. So you either wait for the first stream, or you wait for another stream, and you have to wait for them in some order in a sequential program. And here we are waiting for them in this particular order. And uh, as was mentioned, uh, the data might arrive in one second or a hundred years or never. The other, you know, uh, the client one may just never send a message. And here you are waiting for client one's message which never arrives. Okay. So you want to do other work while that's happening. Okay. So that's exactly what you guys answered. So we should not impose an order on user input in the client. This is not a chess game where, you know, first one user input, then another user input, and we know the order in which they input. And we should not, uh, for the same reason, impose order on client message input. Okay. So a communicating process, now we are generalizing, often needs to process multiple independent streams of data. And order should not be imposed on how these streams are processed. Okay. So as it turns out, you know, even with threading, I have, I have students who I've worked with for years who know concurrency like crazy. But when they're left to themselves to program, Maybe because they have grown up in a web world, they came come up with this solution. They say, well, I'll check if there's any local user input around. You know, you can build abstractions that say, is there any input? You can peek. Okay, you can, and then you can say, if none, let me go and uh, uh, see whether there is uh, uh, remote user input involved. And if so, I'll go and process that. And after that, I'll sleep for a while and check again. The sleep call, you know, a lot of browsers use this call. And the modern day student tends to use that a lot. And I just, you know, as an operating system person, I'm not too happy, obviously. Okay. Why obviously? Because this is busy waiting. Okay. You're co constantly polling. You should not be polling. You should be notified. Okay. And, you know, that's why. When I go and post a message on Piazza, there's a notification sent to you, and you don't have to go and check every five seconds whether the jar has changed or whether my requirements have changed. That's just a waste of your time. Okay? So uh, that's not a good solution. Waste computer resources. Okay? And reduce response time based on sleep time. Okay? If, if between the two, you know, the question is how, how, how often do you poll? If you poll every 24 hours, then you missed all the events that occurred in the last 24 hours. Okay. And if you poll every one second, you're using the computer needlessly. Okay. So we can have multiple threads. Okay. If I've said threads are multiple units of concurrency. So we have two units executing concurrently, say, in the client. And one thread waits for user input. And the other one waits for remote user input. Okay. And you might have a background thread doing some, something else. And guess what? The code just became more modular. Okay, so it's a win-win situation. Not only did you not wait, but you went and decomposed something into multiple threads. So from a software engineering point of view, this is great. Okay. okay. And, and, and often, you know, this, the, 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 this is one of the reasons why threads were added to the OS kernel. Okay, so the OS kernels are supposed to provide threads, but... Uh, OS kernels now even implement threads themselves. And, and, and threads are useful if you have a multiprocessor system, but even if you don't have a multiple processor system, multiprocessor system, it made, makes, makes the kernel more modular. Okay. And in the example I'm talking about, this is exactly what happens. You see a, you see a, the, the top is server. That's a server process. Then you have 
the various clients, Alice, Bob, and Kathy. And each of these particular uh, processes has threads within it as the Eclipse environment here tells you. What these threads are, you will see in great depth in assignment four. Okay? But just to let you know that there are threads. Okay? So, to summarize, um, um, process connection often requires the creation of threads. And the reason is that uh, there are multiple streams of data to be processed. And you'd like to process them modularly and efficiently. And threads allow you to do that. Okay. So we are kind of understand, you know, I'm, I'm sort of hinting that you can understand threads at multiple levels. Okay. So we kind of understand the why and what of threads. Let's get down to a little bit of the how. If you really want to get to the complete how, you have to take the operating system course. Okay. But maybe through analogies and, and, and a little bit of description, you'll get an idea of how and, and whenever you understand how, you understand the what better also. Okay. So the picture I showed you about of threads made threads look like active agents. They are the one that execute your code. Okay. So there, you know, there's a stack of methods and, and there are multiple stacks, one for each thread. And uh, that's the executing engine. And you can select one of the method uh, threads and then the procedure within the thread and see the data structures. You can see the pointer here. This pointer will go and move as, as we go and step through the program. And it is the thread that is stepping through the program. It is the active thing. Okay. And as users of threads, that's what you imagine active threads okay but if you've done os you can think of the thread itself as a data okay it's a piece of data structure with some attribute with some fields okay and this data structure is interpreted by some other active agent which happens to be the thread implementation and thread implementation could be a user level library it could be a, a language it could be an operating system okay so, so there's a thread implementer. So the next question is, and this is particularly, this should be easily answered by those who have done OS and remember the OS, if you haven't purged all the information away from your brain, which when I was a student, I tended to do after the final exam. Okay. Um, but certain things, I think it's hard to forget. So that's my next question. What fields would be associated with threads uh, so that an OS can go and implement threads. So what kind of data structures uh, thread encapsulates? A stack, as you guys said, registers, program counter being one of the registers, priority, okay, status, okay, computer state or whatever. So let's focus on the status. We, and, and that's something you really need to understand. And, as, and Chris pretty much gave the answer as to what the status would be. But let's go and see. So at any time, if you have only one processor, okay, given processor, a processor is executing some thread. Okay, we'll call that the current thread. That's not the only thread in the system. Okay, so this particular thread state is current. Okay, but that's not the only state in the system. There might be a bunch of threads that are eligible to execute, but are not executing because we don't have enough processors. Those are the ready threads. Then there are some threads that are not eligible to run. They may be waiting for user 1's input, maybe waiting for user 2's input or stream 1 input, stream input, maybe waiting for I.O. <coughs> Those are the non-thready threads. And they can be in different queues. Okay, so you guys study queues and data structures. Queues really become important in operating systems. Okay, and distributed systems. Okay. So that is the state and that's something you really need to be aware of. And whether you are in current, ready, or not ready is captured by the thread state or thread status. Okay. So the next question is, given a bunch of ready threads, what triggers context switching? What makes sure that the current thread releases, you know, some other thread uh, takes the place of the current thread? Okay, and I see lots of hands going up, so let's go and take that in the next slide. So what causes rescheduling? Context switching can result as, as, as a lot of time for expiring. I didn't go and put the thread termination in here. I, I couldn't quite fit all this text also. Or some other higher priority thread becoming ready. 
Okay, so even if your time quantum has not expired, and you've, uh, you know, you you've, uh, you know, some some you may be scheduled away because somebody higher priority than you. That's what priority means. Okay. Or current thread makes system call, especially if that system call makes another thread ready. Okay. So the system, in general, context switching is expensive operation. And, and thread switching is expensive operation. When you make a system call, you've done a context switch. Okay. So the system says, okay, you made a context switch. You probably are going to terminate, your, finish your time quantum sooner soon. Why wait for you to make another kernel context switch? I've got you here. Let's go and switch you to another person. Especially if you made some other thread ready. So if you, if you are a notifying thread, we'll see what notify means, and you just unblocked a waiting thread, that waiting thread is often executed. And, and, and so it hurts you almost to be nice and to make somebody else ready because then you become non-current. Okay? But there are there were operating systems that only made did context uh, thread switching when context switching occurred just because that was more efficient. Okay, so from a throughput point of view, that's more efficient. From a fairness point of view, who knows? And and it's interesting that you guys tell me that's you studied that in US class <coughs> because that is the theoretical reason for doing context switching. Okay. And when you have multiple CPUs, they, they can be multiple current threads and maybe even multiple ready queues. And, and so, also multiple ready queues. Okay? You can have one ready queue being served by all the th processors, or you can have a separate ready queue being served by each processor. Okay? And how this switching occurs, you know, uh, it's one of the most fun things to do when you implement, when you're doing operating system to implement thread switching is a really fun thing to do. You really understand systems well. Uh, but uh, we will just use an analogy here because we are not an OS course. And we have three balls here in two hands. And each ball feels that it's being served, whereas there's only two hands. Okay? And so it's like two cores serving three threads. And while, while a ball is in the air, the other balls can be served. Okay? So while a thread is, is waiting for user input, some other thread can be served or, or it can be just put in the ready queue. Okay? So that's the analogy. How that's exactly implemented, uh, we leave that to an OS class that addresses that. Not all OS classes even teach you how to do thread switching. Okay? So we've looked at, uh, we get kind of get an idea of what threads are. Uh, we still have to sort of answer a lot of questions. And Ram mentioned the word runnable somewhere, so that's this, the next question I have is related to that. But again, I'm going to ask the question in a, in a, in a language-independent fashion. So this, this code, this loop, is being executed ultimately by some procedure. Okay? Even if you don't believe in procedures or modularity, okay, you have to put, at least in C and Java, your code into some procedure and and, and and uh, so this procedure could be called by another procedure and so forth. But there has to be a root procedure somewhere that, that, that this particular piece of code is executed associated with it. Okay? And similarly, there is a root procedure associated with the other, other uh, thread also. So what I'm trying to get at is that each thread is associated with a root procedure. And then that root procedure can go and call other procedures and how that happens, we understand from our CS1 class. Okay, a procedure calls another procedure, it waits for the procedure to finish, and then it resumes execution after that procedure. Okay, that's not OS level concurrency issues, that are just regular programming issues. So the question then is, how did P11 and P21 get started? If you can somehow start P11 and P21, then they can call other procedures and follow all the CS1 rules that we know. So we have to understand how did we go and magically get these root procedures to start? Okay, and the, the and the question is, what happens in C? What happens in Java? And let's go and try to understand this in a in a in a, in a uh, more abstract way. And this uh, and 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 before I go get try to get answers, let me go and throw some solutions for you and try to understand the situation better. So, if I'm trying to figure out the answer for the n case, where n is greater than one, 
Let's try to the, uh, uh, answer the question for the n equal to 1 case. If we understand the n equal to 1 case, then we can try to understand the n greater than 1 case also. Okay? So the n equal to 1 case is that both in C and Java, there's a main method that a program is associated with. It's often called main. In C and Java, it's both it's called main. And you go and declare in that program that main method. And the system goes and finds that main method and starts executing it. Okay? So this, the system in Java, it could be the Java virtual machine that finds your main method. And in, and in C, that could be, it could be the OS that goes and finds the main method and it starts. So we know how that starts. Okay? And uh, I've got two kinds of lines here. Okay? And by the way, I will use bold lines and dashed lines. I'll code different things with bold lines and dashed lines. And here, my, my, my bold lines are calls. And my dashed line, I'm calling a fork. Okay, it is the case that the OS went in, resulted in main being called. But I'm not saying the OS called main. I'm saying the OS forked main. Okay? And that's because forking creates a new stack. It creates a new root procedure, a new PC, whereas calling just adds to the current stack. And the same PC just advances around. Okay? So now, now we have this, and for multiple threads to be created, we have to create the threads from an existing, you know, the language and the, the system knows about one thread. That's the default. And somehow from that one thread, we're going to create multiple threads. So there must be some code in that initial thread that goes, went and created the other threads. Okay? So somehow from some procedure that's involved in this particular thread, a fork happens. And that fork results in P21 being called. Okay? So underlying library language OS does some magic to fork. Okay? That we will not study here. That's the OS work. But how do we tell that magic mag magician where to fork? Because P1, P21 is some procedure that we've implemented. It's not the main method. Okay? So it's some procedure we've implemented. So how does this magician get to know what to perform this magic on? Okay? That's the question. And I can go and uh, uh, I can just elaborate on the solution. I can say, well, we know how to do it for what, case one. So let's go and generalize that to case n. So case one, we had one main method in the program with a well-defined header that the system found. And it was a static method in both Java and C. In C, everything is static. I can have multiple static methods. I can have main, then I can have run one, run two, run three, run five, five, 500, run 1001. Okay, if you name your method that, it'll, the system will go and call each of those methods and start multiple threads. That's my design for you. Okay, being, being somebody who likes to generalize from one to n without having to invent new things. Okay, so predefined signatures and, and headers, I should say headers here. Signatures is just the arguments and result type. Headers also includes the name. So predefined signatures, run one args, run n args, or static methods. Okay. So the thread number statically defined. Okay. And I should have put in here what Andrew's point also, that the same method cannot be used for multiple threads. And the arguments are also system defined. Okay, it's all right to go and force that for the main method because the arguments happen to be what the user supplied when they ran the program. But for other threads, one thread might go and start another thread and need to go and pass information to the other thread. And what it passes may be very dependent on the thread. And here we have fixed the arguments. Okay, so that is a problem. Okay, so now I want to know a less restrictive solution. Okay. Then, okay, so multiple thread creation, um, the less restrictive solution. System needs to know which procedure to fork. Okay, how? We can pass the fork procedure address. Okay, and you guys who've done 524 with me, you know that you can have higher order functions that take other functions as arguments. So you really make the thread forker be a higher order function that takes another procedure as an argument. Okay. And, and and calls it procedure. And in C, that's exactly what you can do. In C, you can take the address of any, any of a procedure, of, 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 of a variable, 
and you can find the address of the root procedure and go and pass it to the forking procedure. And the forking procedure, this magician that creates threads, takes this particular procedure and, 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 and starts a, creates a new stack and makes the PC point to the start of this procedure. Okay? That's exactly what happens when you do thread creation. Okay? And that's not the way you do it in C, in Java, because C is a higher, I suppose, higher order functions, but it does no checking. Okay? The, a, a caller can expect a procedure with five arguments, and you can pass a procedure with two arguments. Okay? And we saw that, in fact, in 524, that we could actually do that. And I assume you've seen this in 411 and, and other C-based languages. If you don't, if you haven't, that's, 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 that's what happens. Okay? So in, that's not the solution that, we will, that Java adopts. In fact, because Java cannot solve this problem nicely, it doesn't even allow procedures to be passed as parameters. Okay? So the next question is, how can we have a safer solution than what C has? So we're going to go, go back to the solution that I said that I invented that nobody said knew about, but that was coming near where I wanted to. So here I said, we'll, we'll have a bunch of static methods that have, have well-defined signatures. Run one, run two, run n. Okay. Now we won't have a bunch of static methods. We'll have a bunch of, we'll have a bunch of instance methods. They'll all be called run. Okay. But different implementations of run can do different things. They can do the same thing or they can do different things. So if you want to create a bunch of threads that do the same thing, you use the same run method implementation. If you uh, want a method to do, uh, the, the, the threads to do different things, you use different implementations. Okay? So we'll just have one method called run rather than run one, run n. Okay? And now we can pass instances of classes implementing a parameterless method called run, defined in a well-defined interface, and in Java it's called runnable. And we just go and tell the magician, the, the thread creator, here's my object. Okay? And, and, and now we've got to the root procedure. Okay? So we're going to have a run method. We're going to have multiple runnable implementations. The interface runnable defines run. And, 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 and we can do whatever we feel like in run. So I just said earlier that a fork procedure might need data parameters from the per forker. And I have to go in, de declare, decide the signature of run. And we made run to be a parameterless method. So my next question is, how do we get, uh, how do we pass application specific data to this, to this run method? Okay, so we have the run method. And as, as you guys mentioned, you can just put the data somewhere in the object before you call run. And one way to do that uh, is to have, uh, okay, I, I changed the color, to have a constructor with a with, with variable number of parameters. So remember, a constructor, different classes that implement the same interface can have constructors that totally vary from each other. Okay, the constructor is not part of the interface. So it is that constructor in which you go and pass, put the parameters, and then you call the run method. And the run method can just go and fetch the parameters from its instance variables. Okay? So the parameters of the run method become instance variables in the object that are fetched, global variables in the object that are fetched by the run method. Okay? So this is sort of what's, what's happening now. Uh, we have to go and, and, and tell, tell the, the, the system what, what the runnable is, okay? And uh, we go and, um, we go, so we, we now view the thread not only as a system level object data structure that the system interprets, but also as an application level object that we can manipulate. And to this application level object, we need to go and tell it, you know, what the runnable is, and then we have to we go and invoke other methods on it. So that's what's going on here. So we have, now we have in Java a thread object, which is an object that the system interprets, of course, but it's also an object that the user interprets, and it has got its own methods. 
And one of these methods is to start the thread after it has been bound to a runnable. Okay? And the way we bind it to a runnable is to have a constructor in the thread object that takes a runnable as an argument. Okay, so the runnable object takes as an argument, takes a, has a constructor that, that initializes the parameters, and the thread object, and the runnable object is provided by you. The thread object is provided by the system, it's instantiated by you, but the thread class is provided by the object, by the, by the system, and you go and uh, uh, bind it to a runnable, and then you call start. Okay, and that'll start the, th the, the thread. And there's not only the start method, but there's other methods too that you guys might have seen uh, in OS that you can imagine, which is suspending the thread. So as, as even though you're not the one implementing the thread, you can manipulate the thread by starting it, res suspending it, resuming it, interrupting it, changing its priority, or setting its name. Okay. There are many other calls. This is what I could fit in here. Okay. So a thread is an active agent with its own stack, which you can see in Eclipse. It's a data structure manipulated by the operating system with, the, with fields like registers and so forth. Those are hidden from the user. And what's exposed to the user are methods like these. Okay. In, in a C-like language, you would have system calls to go and invoke these methods. A static calls in Java, you would just have these objects, these methods be part of the thread interface. Okay. So to make this all concrete, um, with an abstract example, you will create a runnable, which is an instance of some runnable class that 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 implements uh, the runnable interface. That class could be called a runnable, it could be called another runnable, so you could have many runnables. So I have a runnable that is an instance of a runnable. I have a runnable two that's all that's an instance of another runnable. Then I create a thread object, passing to the thread object's constructor a runnable. So now the thread object is bound to a root procedure, but it's not yet started. Okay, before you start it, you can give it a name. You can create another thread. You can give it a name. <coughs> then you start. You can start both of them. Okay. So this this slide kind of answers this question, but I want to take this very explicitly. Why go through this process of uh, creating a thread object, creating a thread in the system, which is not in the ready state initially? And then having a start method that puts it in the ready state. And, and so have, having these two be separate steps rather than, so what, what I'm showing you here is that we create a thread object in the non-ready state, in the created state. And then when we do a start, we go and make, put it in the ready state. The question is, why didn't we just go and put it in the ready state immediately? Okay. So that's, that's going to be my next question for you guys. Okay. So we may need to set its name and priority and other attributes. We may need to create a stream of threads that know, know about each other. That means they have references to each other. Okay. And when, when started. So if auto started, thread created earlier will not know about later threads. Okay. So that is a reason to go and have these two be decoupled. It gives you more flexibility. And, and if you want to auto start it, just define a library procedure that goes and starts and creates and starts a method. Okay. So by decoupling things, you get more flexibility. Okay. And let me go and show you some analogies associated with this. So a process creates a set of threads before it starts any of them. A process, if you've done any um, AWT programming in Java or any GUI programming, you often create a frame or a window with a bunch of components in it, sliders, text boxes, and so forth. And you, you go and create the whole structure, tree structure of the window before you say set visible. Okay? You don't go and add a button and say set visible, show that, and then add a text box and show that because the user wants to see the full window or not at all. Okay? So, so the general idea is that we have a notion of a transaction in which we see the effect of a sub-operation only if other sub-operations have also been executed and we don't see individual effects of these operations. Okay? So that's the general principle here and that's why I believe, I don't, I've never seen a discussion of this as to why the start was not done automatically, uh, why, why, why that was done. And the reason I belabor this point is because 
having a separate thread creation and start can cause problems as it did in my class last time. So let me go and ask you and let me bring, bring, uh, bring up that problem gradually. So here's two pieces of code. I could have done, created two runnables and then two threads and then started the threads. Or I could have gone and said runnable dot run, run uh, sorry, this, this has got an error here which I'll try to fix. I could have said a runnable one dot run and then I could have said a runnable two dot run. Okay. That's effectively what I'm doing with the first piece of code also, right? I'm creating a thread that goes and starts, executes runnable uh, of the first runnable, uh, run method of the first runnable and run method of the second runnable. What is the difference between the first piece of code and the second piece of code? The first is more indirect and, and, and uh, uh, okay. So in the first case, as Andrew pointed out, we are creating in the, uh, two different, th we have three different threads, the original thread and two new threads. And the original thread does not wait. Uh, it, ex it, uh, it executes the uh, run methods asynchronously. In the second case, we have only one thread and it goes and executes the first method, waits for it synchronously, and then when it returns, executes the second method. Okay. And if I went and did this, the first one, I didn't, I didn't say a thread one dot start. I said a thread one dot run then a thread two dot run, I actually do the same thing as what the bottom code is. Because the run method, as it turns out, thread also has a run method, okay, because of legacy reasons. And that run method will execute the runnables run method. Okay. So if you accidentally say a thread one dot run rather than thread one dot start, you won't get multiple threads. Will such accidents occur? Guess what? They did occur Jed is nodding because he was in that class last time and there was a student who did this mistake, this, made this mistake and was complaining why the system was not working and three days later he figured out what the problem was and that was because he didn't call it start. Okay? So this can be a costly mistake and I just want to sort of point this out. Okay, let me sort of go to my, put my software engineering hat on and say have, what, have, have we done something correct from a software engineering point of view? <coughs> And one of the things in software engineering is layering. Okay. We tend to layer software and a layer that is higher level is allowed to call methods in lower layers because it can see those lower layers. But a lower layer is supposed to be oblivious to the layers above it. And that typically means that you don't go and call methods in the layer above. Okay. That's what software engineering tells us. If you've done networking, you've seen that layering has been is use white, uh, you know, you study the seven layers or the three layers. There's many views of how networking should, networking stack should go, but they all believe in layered networking. Okay, though I've been in research conferences where they say layering is not good, okay, for various reasons. It has to do with performance. Uh, so that's a trade-off, okay. Assuming there's no performance issues here, this is kind of crazy because the thread implementation layer is what's given. The thread user is above it. The thread user should be able to call a method in the thread implementation. But we are allowing the thread implementation to call a method in the, in the thread user, in particular the thread implementation calls the forked methods, the run methods, the methods that you pass to pthread library. And if, if I've cheated here, I've cheated before too. When I talk to observables and observers, observable is supposed to be independent of observers. It's supposed to know nothing about the observers. So you can add observers after an observable is created to do things that the observable never dreamed could be done. And uh, an observer, when, when we add an observer to an observable, the registry method has to be called in the observable. So that's a down call. But I'm allowing these up calls where the observable is calling notification methods in the layer above. So have we lost the benefits of layering? Are we cheating? What's going on here? So high level layers are supposed to make down calls. Are up calls not disallowed by layering principle? Are they not in oxymoron? I mean, if you can make an up call, then that's not a layer. Okay, up call, you, you, you define what is a layer by looking at the call structure. And if the calls are going both ways, then there's, that's not a layered system at all. So that's the question for you. So uh, what you guys said was that yes, people are making, uh, lower layers are making upper layers, uh, calls to upper layers. But 
the lower layers don't really depend on what these calls do. Okay, when an observer goes and notifies, uh, observable, uh, observable notifies observers, what the notify method does, doesn't affect really what the observer, observable is supposed to do next. Okay, when a thread implementation goes and forks a thread, what it does next doesn't depend on what the fork thread actually did. Okay, and so semantically there was no real dependency, but syntactically was there a dependency? And, and, and this, this, what I say here, uh, shows that even syntactically or at the API level, there was no real dependency. When we say that the dependencies should all go downwards, we really mean that upper layers should go and depend on the API provided by the lower layers and not vice versa. Yes, lower level layers make up calls in upper level layers. Okay. But the signature or the header of the methods that they call are defined by the lower level layers. Okay, so when an observable goes and makes a notify method call in an obse uh, observable <laughs> makes a notify method call in an observer, that signature of the notify method was defined by the observable, not by the observer. And all objects that, that implement that notify method can, 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 can go and get that event. Okay, similarly when um, the thread, uh, imp uh, the fork thread goes and implements the run method sig uh, header, the run method signature was defined by the thread implementation, not by the uh, invoke thread. Okay, so the thread implementation does not depend on the API of the thread forker, it's the either, other way around. Okay, and so that happens syntactically and semantically. So the header up calls are defined by the calling layers. So callee depends on caller API. And in layering API and functional functionality dependencies are one way with both down calls and up calls. Okay. So that is why we are not cheating. Indeed, we have layering and and uh, and so so we, we get the functionality we want um, while uh, uh, while while uh, following the layering principle. Okay, now an up call is often also called a callback. Okay, so they can be um, the lower level layer needs to know which procedure to call. Sometimes, okay, it can do two things. It can either assume that the signature is well defined, like the J JVM assumes that you've got a main method signature, and it finds a main method and calls it. Okay, or an upper level layer might have handed the lower level layer a pointer to an uh, to 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 a uh, up call and say this is what you should call. Okay, so basically before the up call was invoked, a down call was ca called to tell the lower level layer what to call. It's like when you go and leave a message on an answering machine, you leave a number there and they call you back based on what number you left. Okay, so. Um, when 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 the up call is dynamically decided, often it is um, uh, identified by a down call. Okay, so then the up call is a callback. Okay. And main arg is an up call that is not a callback because it follows a certain signature, and and the JVM uh, just finds it. And in the case of C, uh, the operating system finds a main method um, and just starts a new process uh, with that signature. Okay, so that's that. That was the answer, and now we can just summarize what we did in that uh, this PowerPoint stack was motivate threads from distributed computing point of view. Okay, and we said that look, there may be com independent communication streams that have to be managed, and since they're independent, it makes sense to not block waiting for some event to occur in a communication stream and block the whole process. We can have special threads for each communication stream that uh, that block on that stream okay and we saw that a thread can have can, can there can be multiple views of a thread uh, it can be viewed as an active agent that has a stack and that executes code okay it has and that code in turn accesses data structures or we can think the thread itself as a data structure that is manipulated by uh, the op the uh, thread implementation and, and that is associated with aspects that are of interest to the implementation, such as what its state is, whether it is current, ready, 
what his registers are, what his priority is. Okay. So, from the implementation point of view, it's a data structure. Uh, from the application point of view, it's both an active agent and also a data structure because you have to create the initial thread object, at least in Java, and you can then go in before you start it. And, and so, at that, that point, it's an object. And at any point, you can go and change its priority. You can go and resume it, suspend it. You can kill it. So, it's, it, it, even from an application point of view, it can act both as an active agent and a, pass, and, and, and a data structure to be manipulated. Okay? And to start a thread, you need to give the root of the uh, method in the stack, uh, in the thread stack. And uh, there are many ways to do so. You can do there at least two ways we've seen. One is that it has a well-defined signature, a static signature. And the other is it has, a, it has, a, uh, it has again, a well-defined signature, but that can uh, be invoked by, that can be, uh, that's, a, that's a signature of an instance method. And then you can have multiple objects that go and uh, implement that method. And the exact object in Java is passed uh, as an argument to the thread object. And so the thread object can then, when started, knows what to execute. And in C, uh, we go and uh, have an address of that procedure. Okay. So, um, and uh, the thread creator can use, uses a down call in Java to go and specify which object, in which object the run method should be called so that uh, the thread implementation knows where to start the stack.